a peace and blessings to you. My name is Jerry B. I am the entree musician and so are you. Welcome to a very special edition of the Entree Musician. As you know, if you've been following us, we have been blessed to have some incredible Entree Musicians on. And what we try to do is go right across the board, whether they are sitting at the apex of the music industry or whether they just released their music and don't have much out and are still learning, we try to engage with them. You know why? Because we're all entree musicians together trying to take it to the next level. And what makes this episode so special to me personally, and man, we've been blessed to have people like Chris Jasper of the Isley Brothers, uh, Bob Baldwin. Uh, we've had um, uh, Gary Hines from The Sounds of Blackness and on and on. But we had the opportunity to have a conversation with Michelle Vice Maslin. Emmy award-winning songwriter and producer who has worked with everyone in the business over 40 years. Pat Williams, Engelbert Humperdinck, Bob Dylan, now Rogers, Kesha, Jonathan Butler. I could go on and on and on. It has been said that Michelle's music is being played somewhere in the world every day, 365, 24-7, somewhere in the world, a Michelle Vice Maslin song is being played. Now, those are her credentials, but what I want you to tune into is her heart. And she has been so gracious and was so generous with her time. I was expecting this is gonna be 40 minutes. I only had a couple of questions prepared and she was able to share her heart, share her wisdom, share her advice. And so this is actually a two-part episode and I'm not editing anything out of it. I, I've just found the middle the middle of the uh, conversation and kind of cut it in half. And then for those of you who are subscribers to The Entree Musician, you've clicked on the backstage pass and you've registered. You know, we have with everyone, just about everyone who we have had a conversation with, they do bonus uh, time with us in the backstage so that you can have access to stuff that we don't make available to the general public. And here again, I thought, given her time, given her schedule, she would only you know provide 10 or 15 minutes tops. And I would be very cool and thankful for that. Yet another 45 minutes went by like nothing. We wound up talking on average about three hours or so. So this is a really special addition because of the wisdom that she has, the experience that she has as a songwriter, not only pitching to music supervisors and music libraries and having her music in so many different shows and film, but also to top artists that she is writing for all the time. My pleasure to introduce this to you, which is why I've come on for this very special introduction. But I've, I've found in her a friend and a, a genuine spirit. And I thought, man, let's, let's just get this one out as quickly as possible. So for this week and for next week, uh, we'll chain these two episodes together, uh, separately but together if you understand what I'm saying. But uh, without further ado, it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you my new friend, Michelle Vice Maslin. Hey, peace and blessings to you. My name is Jerry B. I am the entree musician and so are you. And so is this super soul sister who's sitting to the left of your screen. You know, we've had entree musicians on before. We've had ultra entree musicians as we call them. We have to invent a new title for Michelle, because we're gonna to have to start with what she hasn't done. Because everything that has happened in the music industry that you're dreaming about and that you think you can't accomplish, she's been there, she's done that. I'm telling you, Michelle Vice Maslin, not a day goes by on any television set or radio where you don't hear one of her songs. She's an Emmy Award winner. She has 5,000 plus placements in sync licensing, TV, film, gaming, you name it. 
This is Michelle and she has agreed to grace us with her time and I couldn't be more delighted. Blessings to you, dear heart. How are you? Oh, I'm amazing, Jerry. Thank you. How could I not be after that amazing introduction? Blessings to you. That's so beautiful. Thank you so, so much. I mean, you Thank have you. really, 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 really enamored us with your accomplishments. And I'm grateful for that. I feel like I know you already because I've been trolling you <laughs> on all of your webinars and the videos and the interviews you've done. And here's one thing I wanna say before I ask my first question. I wanna say this to you because when we were on the webinar with Barry Coffin for musicsupervisor.com and I already knew who you were and I just chatted and, hey, I would love to interview you on The Entree Musician. You just graciously said, yes, I'd love to. You didn't know me from Adam. I mean, you didn't ask how many hits I, I get or views or subscribers. You just said yes. And so that's, that told me something about your spirit right off the bat. So thank you very much. Ah, thank you. I'm honored. Are you kidding? I'm honored. You know, just blessed to be asked to serve and serve your audience and the world. And, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've been through the school of hard knocks. So why should everybody else have to go through that? You know, I love helping people and I, I love that you do as well. You know, I that's do. so important. I know. And that, that we have to do that. There's no point in people stumbling through things that we can help them with. Yeah. And you yeah. put that so very, very well. Well, I, uh, I had made up in my mind uh, with all of the interviews that you've done, I'm sure you've been asked the same questions 2 million times. And I said, well, Jerry, we can't take her down those streets because you know, she can phone it in for that. But I really want to know with everything that you've done, what do you find is the, the greatest challenge for you maintaining the consistency that you've been able to acquire? What is that one challenge that you continue to plow through or work around? Do you know what that is? You know, you hit the, the nail on the head when you said maintaining. It's maintaining, it's sustaining. That's the challenge. Mm. I mean, people all think, oh God, if I just get one hit, I just get one cut if I just get one placement oh life will be so much easier but you know sustaining it is so hard yeah it's every day it's facing the rejection and brushing it off every single day so let me yeah. let me ask this question then so you're saying what you're telling us is that a young lady who has achieved not only an Emmy nomination, but has earned an Emmy, has 5,000 placements, that there's still some challenges. That's what you're saying. It's not easy street after you quote unquote make it. That's what you're telling us. No, nobody cares about your, your awards mm. and they don't care about your, your discography and they don't care about your hit songs. And they, they just don't care. They just want what they want. Wow. And, and in order to sustain your place in in this world of work and music is is challenging every day and that's kind of exciting right because you never know what's going to happen mm. I didn't, someone wrote me just before we got on here who i worked with maybe 20 years ago to produce a song for them haven't talked to them in ages uh you never know right? What uh, someone's going to want, what someone's going to need, who might remember you, who mm -hmm. might, who you think would remember you and they don't mm -hmm. and discard you. I mean, so I always see this business as survival of the fittest. And that's why music is my heir, because if it weren't my heir, I couldn't sustain it, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. so we were discussing that before here, that when music is your heir and it's everything you are, then you have no choice but to be able to maintain and be able to sustain and make it through all the rejection. So I always say to people, you know, the playing field is equal. Mm -hmm. It's so equal because they, everybody wants to discover somebody new. 
So yeah, I'm tried and true, but that's not so interesting sometimes, mm -hmm. right? So I, there's the people say, well, it's so easy for you. You have so many credits, blah, blah. No, it's not because they want you. They want to discover you. They're like, yeah, yeah, I know what Michelle does. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. What else you got? What else you got? <laughs> right. So I have to fight that as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you start out, you're really young and green and no one wants to take any chance on you and no one respects you. And then you get older. And then no one wants to take any chance on you. No one respects you. I mean, it's it, it, it's it's an everyday day thing. But let's look at that in an empowering, inspiring way, right? Because I do it and yeah. I hang in there. And I don't let any of that rejection bother me, mm. you know? That's and, so good. Yeah, or, and if it does, I swimming is my passion. I go swim and wash them all off, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Jump in that water, just wash them off. Because, wow. because we have to have a sense of our own self and happiness, right? Mm -hmm. to well, that's, that's so very good that you say that because, you know, one thing about creatives is, you know, there's a space in us that is so sensitive and that when we face rejection or we face that, no, we're taking it more personally. It's not, you know, necessarily, well, they don't, that song doesn't fit or this creative isn't right for that particular project. A lot of times we take it internally. And so that causes us to really be negative in other points of our lives when we can just say, hey, that no will lead to a yes. And I believe there was something that you said previously about a thousand rejections. Like you can put a thousand submissions out there and, and maybe get five <laughs> yeses from that. Yeah, I mean, or not even. So, right, so the no's don't matter. That's where it boils down to. The no's don't matter. Only the yeses matter. And of course, you know, every time I want to retire and quit, I get all these no's. There's a yes. And then I'm like, damn, now I have to still do this. So, <laughs> right? I'm like, right. oh, God. So, so that's what happens, you know, the, the yeses show up. But the, the no's, it's all like numbers, right? The more you throw out there, the more possibilities you have. Right. So some people will say to me, you know, I, I just can't take this. Like, I just keep getting rejected. And I'll say, how many places did you send the song? And they'll say, two, mm. two. Okay, I sent my last song to th like 3,000 people. Mm. So two, like two is not even a number. That's right. <clears throat> yeah. So, so you have to put yourself out there. Yeah. You know, yeah. of course it goes without saying the song has to be good. The production has to be better. I mean, sure. you know, but if it is, then if you don't plaster the world with it, you're just going to get two no's. Mm. Right. So good. Yeah. It's, but it's so true, it's but huge. people are afraid. And I try to tell them, look, it's a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. You have music. They need music. Right? They That's need right. music. So don't worry that you're bothering them. You're not bothering them. That's their job. Their yes. job is to listen to the music and use the music. Your job is to create the music and send them the music, market the music. Mm -hmm. But if you don't market it, then nothing happens. Plus, what's meant for us is meant for us, right? Yes. Like, right. like if you get some big placement or, or a big cut with an artist that I wanted, it wasn't meant for me. Mm -hmm. I'm happy for you. I have to celebrate you, yeah. right? I can't be angry with God or you yeah. or anything. It wasn't meant to be. Sure. It just wasn't mine. That's and right. that's how I sustain. And that's how I look at it, right? And that's sometimes right. like someone will listen to a record and they'll go, they'll say to me, God, that whole album sucks. I can't believe it. I sh my songs are so much better. And mm -hmm. I'll say, well, did you pitch any of your songs to that artist? Well, no. Well, no. So it's moot. Can't get upset, right? Exactly. I, if I didn't have time to pitch songs for Kelly Clarkson's record, that's my problem. That's my fault. So mm -hmm. how can I get upset that I don't have any songs on it? I didn't try. Right? It seems so simple, you know, and we yeah. complicate things, but that's that's just it. If you don't plant the seeds, you don't you reap the harvest. It's just like that. 
and you are a planter. And I think right. maybe some of that is because uh, because of your Queens, uh, New York uh, upbringing and you, you know the art of the hustle, right? Yes, sir. We Queens girls are tough. That's <laughs> right. We are tough. We have serious accents and um, <laughs> that I never can get rid of. And I try. But yeah, you know, I do agree with you. I think that I'm so grateful to have grown up in New York City because mm -hmm. it definitely gives you a leg up. It's definitely, we're tough, yes, you know? Yes. And I, I definitely don't sugarcoat a lot of things. So when I teach my students, I tell them the first minute, I'm not very kumbaya, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. You're not gonna get a lot of that out of me. Because I'm going to tell you, life is tough. This business is tougher. Mm -hmm. And there are no excuses. And that's where I come from, right? Mm -hmm. I come from that. I come from achieving successes. Yes. And yeah. I didn't know I was supposed to be happy. No one ever told me that. <laughs> I mean, people are talking California. I live in California. People talk about happy, being happy. Oh, really? I, my parents never told me to be happy. <laughs> they told me to make money. You know, <laughs> they told me in New York that I was supposed to achieve and mm -hmm. do something, right? Like you were talking right. about all your daughters, they're all achieving, yeah. right? Yeah, so are. that's what I was taught, that that was what was acceptable. And there were no excuses. And everybody's always making excuses of the dog ate my homework. And I'm like, nobody cares, right? So I, I, that's also part of sustaining is I tell my students, Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. They don't care if your mother is sick. Mm -hmm. They don't care if your yeah. dog passed away. They really don't care. They need this and you are supposed to supply it. And that's, that's it. Correct. And that's then once correct. you have that mindset, it's sort of easier because yeah, you realize there are no excuses, right? It's like if you cheat on your spouse, there's no excuse. None. You might have done it, but there's no excuse. You so, don't have one. You're not supposed to do that. So, right? So it's That's very cut right. and dry. And so it's like that in in business as well, right? So I think also that's how I see it is if I don't show up, then I have to be prepared that I burn the bridge. Wow. You know, that's and I've so worked at my career that way, telling people because they all say, well, I didn't do this. I didn't have time to go to the studio. I didn't have time to this. Mm. I didn't, well. That's, that's not their problem. That's your problem. That's so, right. yeah. So that's, that's I guess right. that's Queens as well. I'm, I'm very, I'm quite tough. So I see that. All no, five feet of me is very it, tough. It's necessary. It's necessary. <laughs> when you look at your track record and when you look in the rearview mirror to see what you've accomplished, I know that when your nose was against the grindstone, you were not really trying to tally up any points. You were just going at it day by day. And then subsequently, this is what has happened to you. And so, yeah. So and the key is the key is to not step on anyone, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. The key is there's enough work to go around. Yeah. And that's right. having that abundance mentality. We were talking mm -hmm. about that a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. before we, we went on here, but, you know, the poverty mentality saying, okay, well, it's only so many slices of the pie, but no, abundance means there, there is no amount of slices. You can just go and get yours because that door is going to open for you if you continue knocking on it. Yes, exactly. And, and there aren't enough hours in the day for me to write every song that's needed or produce every song that's needed. And there's even Diane Warren, there's not enough hours in the day for her True. to do all that. You know, True. there's enough abundance for everybody, like what you're saying, who participate. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Well, why don't you take us through a day of uh, Michelle uh, Vice Masson? What does a typical day look like for you? Oh God, a typical day never goes as planned. That's all like, right? You want to make God laugh, tell him your plan, right? right? God, every day I get up thinking I'm going to accomplish all this stuff and then that doesn't happen. Mm. But because there's just so many things that people need, you know, that they, they need songs and they need stems and they need productions and they need me to change something and my students need me to answer something and like you know so I always have really good intentions but but usually everything gets derailed but but in the first what I do first in my day in terms of 
work and getting it together is I read the trades. Mm -hmm. So that's my first thing in the, in the day. And the problem is right now that there are too many trades and they fire at you all day long wow. emails of things that are happening. So I have a filing system, things to read later, things to read now, mm -hmm. things to toss, you know, things to do. I mean, I have all these different files. Yeah. And, but that's basically the first thing is I want to see what's going on in the world and in the world of business, of music business. So both the, the world in general, what happened in the news, I wanna see quickly what's going on. And I wanna see, you know, what projects are being made, what new things got picked up, what got canceled, what artists are making albums. So I'm, I'm, I'm I, there's a bunch of trades that I read or skim through. And that's the first thing I do. And I also answer all the emails because you know, when I wake up in the morning, there's usually at least 500 emails. Sure. Yeah. And even now, while we do this interview, when we're done, I'll have 200 emails. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it, it, I'm bombarded with people asking me for things. Yeah. So, and I like to take care of them. So mm -hmm. I don't like not to answer. So uh, I have a coach and she doesn't like this. She mm -hmm. thinks I should set she has times like color coded spreadsheets of like within time management you know, or something. Yeah, it's her time management. <laughs> and like 10 and 12, she answers emails and then she doesn't the rest of the day. And like she has all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, I can't do that because <laughs> if you call me and you need something for a song, I need to stop and give that to you. So she doesn't like that, but my world exists that way, you know, that, that I need to serve and service these people that are these music supervisors and a and r people that i work with so mm -hmm. so basically all day i'm answering emails and in that i'm trying to get something done for me so <laughs> i don't get as much done for me as i do for everybody else <laughs> and uh but and so yeah and then at night pre-covid because covid of course changed all our stuff Certainly. So, but I usually go to the studio at night and I usually work at night from about eight to midnight or one. And that's when I do music productions or write. So usually I do that, but I, during the day and I start pretty early, seven thirty ish, I'm, I'm doing like 11 hours of marketing. Wow. So even so you're when I'm more marketing space, than you're doing creative. Yes. I'm doing more marketing mm -hmm. than creative. And so I do about, I put in like 16, 17 hours a day. And, and most of it is marketing. So most of it, I'm getting rejected. <laughs> and then I go to the studio. And because, because in my world, if I create, and a lot of people ask that, like, how do they, how do they uh, balance the creative with the business is like, because the creative for me is more draining, actually. Mm. Right, right especially writing not producing right. like i can like, spend hours and hours and hours in the studio working with musicians we got singers all that mixing that that's not so taxing mm. but writing i find very taxing and if i write during the day i'm just mush i can't get any work done mm -hmm. so i really try never to i haven't written during the day in years because mm -hmm. because it just destroys the whole ecosystem for me, you know, I because after I finish working on the writing, I just need a drink and to do nothing. Mellow out, mellow out. I'm mellow done. Out. Yeah, it's just so brain draining. Mm. So usually I do that at night. So that's my day, you know, and 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 I take a nibble here and there, and sometimes I pass out and take ten minutes of a nap because I'm so tired, right. and. And uh, I usually work outside. I like to sit in the sun mm -hmm. and pitch songs and market and do all of that because then at least it's happy and bright. But right now we're in May gray and so we don't get any sun. We haven't had any for five days, but wow. in sunny California, it's gray. Yeah. But yeah, so that's, I mean, I hope that, you know, that answers it. I'm, feel, I'm yeah. fielding whatever shows up, you know? Understood. And we never now, know. You are comfortable and you have your feet 
firmly planted in both the sync world as well as working with artists, uh, you know, one tends to be obviously more uh, business, I guess, but with the creative, with working with artists, I mean, which one do you really migrate toward? Or are you just equally right on point, equilibrium with both, both of them? Do you prefer? Yeah, I, lo I love to do both. And there's a question no one ever asked me. So there we go. Mm -hmm. I love, yeah, I love, I love to do both. When I write songs, like the one thing that I don't believe in is writing for sync. I do not believe in that. I write songs to write a great song. That's good. Hopefully, sometimes That's they're, good. they're good, sometimes they're not so good, just like everybody else, you know, it's not like every song I write is great. And I try to make them great, but I try to make them great songs. I don't try to think, well, this is for sync, who cares? So I don't come from that place. And so when I write with artists, I usually have a discussion and agreement with them that we can pitch it for sync as well as for their album or whatever is going on usually they're open to that right because they want possibilities yeah but i try to make the best song possible that's good yeah i mean I, if and there are parameters i mean if i'm writing with a major artist mm -hmm. you know then i'm following their voice and what they want Right. Well, actually, yeah. anytime I'm writing with an artist, it's about them. It's not about me. So even if it's a brand new artist and they're 12 years old, it's about them. Yeah. You know, I'm just channeling them. But you're not an artist yourself, though. But you work with all of these artists and then you work in, in the sync world. So but you're you're well, I'm a secret, quiet closet artist. Are sure. You a closet when artist? I, yeah. When I started out, I was an artist. Well, you yeah. were in a band, right? Early I was in many years, bands. Singer. Yeah. Yes, I was in bands. I did performance art, very weird stuff. And I so I started out as an artist, mm -hmm. for sure. And through the years, right? Yeah. Every so often, I do something as an artist. Is that right? Yeah. See, that, that I did not know. So you, you release something on your own and just say, hey, this is me. This is just because I wanted to do it. It's not. Right, exactly. That's good. That's exactly. Good. A, a couple have just got placed. And so that's always fun. Mm -hmm. I have a new little project. So I always have a, a little thing, you know, every so often I, I come out and sing and sing and do something that's for my own soul and, and, and that, time. but like, yeah, but it's definitely from my soul. And do I like making a uh, commercial things with it yeah of course you know yeah. i mean for sure if people want to use them that's fantastic yeah. but but i do also work with a lot of artists and i have a single out right now with jonathan butler who's one of my um, most favorite yes favorite I collaborators and I've, I've written with him for 20 years and we have a new single out and it's amazing because all these famous jazz cats play on it we have dave cause and candy oh. dulfer mesa leak is on it oh jeffrey osborne marcus miller plays mm. on it yes oh my god i think i'm missing some people it's just like loaded with all these people just shared their talents on our song it's like wow. so incredible but jonathan is amazing to write with and of course when i write with him i channel him mm-hmm Right, I, he's I'm such a there. Great spirit too. He has just a, wow. such a wonderful spirit. Yes, he's very religious and very spiritual. Yeah. He, he's he's amazing. So that's all I can say. I love working with him. He's an amazing voice. He's an amazing musician, guitar player, and and just a great collaborator. It's really wonderful. And and to write, you know, for him and he sing and have him sing also things I write to write in his voice. Yeah. You know, because I, I we are so different. Well, we're the same age, but other than that, you know, we yeah. we have different. We're very different, and it's, it's so powerful. That's awesome. <laughs> well, let's do let's do this since you you opened up that uh, that closet. Let's uh, let's do a little name dropping, and and uh, oh. I'm gonna. Uh, you know, because you've worked with so many different people, maybe you can describe them in one word. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh my god. Bob Dylan. Legend. Engelbert Humperdinck. Oh wow. 
and one word. Wow. One word for Engelbert. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Excited. Excited. Yeah. Sarita Wright. I was just talking about Sarita yesterday. Okay. Songbird. Mm. Songbird. Sarita Magical. I was mm. just telling someone actually that how even when I was a little pish and I wrote with her that mm. she sang a demo for me. Wow. She sang for me. I was oh. just starting out and she sang my song for my goodness. Has to be beautiful. And and yeah, Sarita, so sorry she's gone. She amazing songbird. Mm. Yes. Absolutely. One more. Now now Rogers. A gift. 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 Blessing. Nile Rogers is my the reason I'm here. Nile Rogers took me in, mentored me, didn't have to. Wow. Set me up with people had let me shadow him all mm. day for years in his studio and wow. and just yeah he's special special guy he, you know he really is an amazingly nice human he is what you see and wow. some, i i don't know anybody who's ever has a bad word about nile that's all i can tell you just we're, all the people all of us who have worked with him yeah know it like hanged and talked to each other like he has he had this besides his amazing talent his this magic mm. of kindness and wow. and the reason why he worked with me is because my my stepsister she just passed away and mm. actually Niall made the most beautiful tribute of her is that which right? was so beautiful uh she she had been friends with him since in the early 80s and she said to him, he kept wanting to like hang and date her. And she said to him, I'll go out with you if you help my sister. And, he, that, did. and he did. Did she so, date him? Did she date him after? He not really. Oh, no, not I really. mean, she's, she's been like, she's been buddies with him for 40 years. Wow. But wow. I think they like the cat and mouse, the two of them. Personally, I think it was. You know, they were, they played for 40 years. Oh. So until she passed. And then he, yeah, the most beautiful tribute on his Facebook page. If you ever see it's so beautiful. But anyway, but but she he she she was bold enough to ask, right? That's why we have to be bold. She was bold enough to ask, and he was so loving to say yes. And I was in LA then and I went back to New York. And I stayed in New York and, and just, he set me up. I had a big hit song, set me up with his people. Mm. I mean, wrote with me, he wrote with me. I mean, you know, again, like kind of like Sarita singing for me. It's like, you know, yeah. I, I was a little bitch of Fisher. Mm. Um, I, I, I just, I just feel that, <clears throat> excuse me, I have bronchitis. So I, I, I feel blessed. All these people that you mentioned, I've written with so many famous people. It's really Definitely. like yesterday I was talking to Randy Jackson, like we hadn't talked in like years and we were on the phone for like an hour and talking about all these people and like, God, and I wrote with Randy, you know, mm -hmm. probably in 1990 when he was with Journey and like, yeah. you know, I, I, I've just been just, I got to learn with some really amazing people, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, you what a what a what a blessed life. But again, that Queens, New York, stick to itiveness, hustle uh, has gotten you by God's grace into all of these doors. But you know, it's not luck. And that's when I when I see your career, when I watch what you're doing, when I'm I'm checking out the videos, I can see that this is a young lady who has gone for it. Yes. You've had the Nile Rogers who's helped to open up certain doors and place you in certain rooms where you may not have uh, the opportunity to get to yourself. But what you did with it when you were in the room is so special because that took you to the next room and to the next place. So 
Yeah, I thank you it. so much because because I I thank you because I have worked so hard. Mm-hmm. I it took me eleven years till I had a hit song. Mm-hmm. Where the most amazing thing was, people were not saying, "Oh, she doesn't deserve it." Mm-hmm. Everybody was saying, "Oh my God, if anybody deserves it, she does." Like they were so exhausted from me pushing <laughs> so hard. Like you could see the relief on a and R people's faces, like because they'd rejected me so much that you could see them feeling better almost about themselves because something happened for me. Because yeah, because I had exhausted everybody. Like I was in their face. My lord. No, I was just relentless. I was like showing up at doorsteps. I would, I would pitch songs and I would show up. Mm, Like mm, I mm. wouldn't like send this. Well, in those days it was a cassette. I wouldn't send that in the mail. Like I would drive to like the record label and I would go to the receptionist and I'd say, Oh, is Carol here? Can I see her? I mean, I would, I would like, I'd sometimes I'd get lucky that they'd go get the A&R person and they'd, Take me back and they i mean i i would just show up and hand them everything i was i was not giving up i was at every single schmooze and it's so much easier now because we just have this box sure. right we don't have to go anywhere sure, but right. in those days you really had to show up and i was schmoozing and i was making connections and getting mm. business cards and and following up with them and sending music and getting rejected and <laughs> <laughs> you know but wow. but but yeah yeah but but exactly like it wasn't like oh well you know someone helped me i was hustling those connections and i was Absolutely. hustling those deals and i was just doing everything to try yeah. Is that how you met your uh, wonderful husband? Because, I mean, he is a stellar uh, engineer in his own right. I mean, were you just... Uh, oh, yeah. And producer. He produced David Bowie, David Bowie and Eric Fly, yeah. and Melissa Manchester, and James Taylor. I mean, he's yeah. like one of the most famous producers and engineers yes. of all time. So, yeah, but actually, we we met because of a, someone who I wrote songs with. Mm-hmm. And this person that I wrote songs with, Chuck Wild, his name is, he developed all the sound design from Michael Jackson for many albums. So he made wow. all the weird sounds that that now we get in keyboards and can well, sure. tweak. But in those days, it was d- more difficult. And he he did this for Michael. Mm-hmm. And my husband owned a big studio in L.A. and was engineering the history album for Michael. And Michael was recording in and Bruce Swedeen was producing and Chuck was doing the sounds. My husband was engineering. Harry Maslin is my husband. Yeah, and, and Harry said to Chuck, I'm looking for a female artist, a new female artist to work with. And Chuck recommended me, which goes back to me being an artist in my own right. Yes. Right. And, right. and so he set us up. We were set up. But I believe we were all always set up on a personal level as well. And from the day we met, we've been hanging out. So we hit it off. When I left the studio that day, my husband laughs and said that he said to all his employees, there goes my future ex-wife, right? <laughs> but, but that was almost well, 25 years ago and I'm still go. here. So <laughs> thank you. So yeah, so, oh, and my so husband blessing. is amazing and I am so blessed because he engineers for me. Mm-hmm. And that is my secret weapon. My Indeed. mix sound amazing. He mixes, he engineers. He's, you know, if I say to him, can you make it sound more, s-? you know, I don't know how to do that. You know, right. he knows what every knob is for, right. you know, <laughs> he knows like, and if I say, can you make the bass a little more boom, boom, he knows how to do that. Yeah. And yeah. like, and like everything sounds incredible. And he also, because producing is my passion, which a lot of people don't know, but it's not really songwriting. Producing is my passion, which as a female is, there's only 2% of females that are professional music producers like me. Mm-hmm. And it's not easy, Yeah. but he lets me be the producer. He 
he he follows your vision he does because look he is as famous as it can be i mean he produced david bowie's fame and yeah. golden years and things might be as big but nothing is bigger than that he has nothing to prove he is so confident and he lets me be the producer and just ask him can you turn this knob you know yeah. he and i'm so blessed because of that right because he understands how difficult it is as a female yes to be the producer mm -hmm. you know and and not not wanting to oh woe is me but yeah, i will sure. say you know i'm a five foot hundred pound person i'm the tiny little girly girl mm -hmm. and so you know that that makes it even more difficult to because i want to be respected and of course my new yorkness <laughs> and and to get the production gig mm -hmm. is not so easy sure people don't want to sure. give me the gig they usually give sure. me the gig because it's in my hard drive and they want that right and they're right. kind of disappointed that i produced it <laughs> Because like, well, okay. I'm so honest, right? So, so why why is that? You gotta unpack that a little bit. Why would they be? You know, I mean, the songs are cranking. You have uh, excellent track record. Why would they be disappointed that you were the producer? On because the they want to work with a guy. Hmm. They don't want to work with a little girl. So that stigma is still. I don't know. I'm, oh, I, nothing so, has changed. So I have three daughters. So I, uh -huh. you know, I'm all about empowering right. women. Of course, my my wife is wonderful. So I don't. I don't see, you know, I, I guess I'm not wired to see that there would be a stigma whether there's a woman or a man uh, in the producer's chair. But I didn't know that. I didn't know that stigma was. Yeah, there's a total stigma. There's only two. That's the, yeah, they just did the Annenberg study again. It's like the third year in a row and only 2% of professional music producers are women. Hmm. None of that have charted lately. There are none. There's like none. You know, so being one, I feel very proud. But my my main co-writer, I write with a lot of people, as you know, but my main co-writer I've been writing with now for 40 years. So his name is always on the song, but he's not the producer. Understood. That's very Understood. disappointing to them. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Larry Treadwell, he's amazing. He's an amazing musician, by the way. He's, he's just- Guitarist, every... right? Oh yeah, guitar. Yeah, bass he, but that's his main instrument but he plays everything mandolin and cello and, and violin and drums and piano i mean you just stick something in his hands and he can play it he's yeah, it. he's amazing and he writes lyrics and he's he's amazing but when they see a male name there they're kind of assuming mm -hmm. that the product is in his hard drive now, who's the proverbial they? When you say that, are the they's the the A and R people? The yeah, music, music supervisors. supervisors really? Exactly. Oh. Yes. Okay. The, the 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 production companies, the film companies, the producers, the directors, everybody wow. is really hoping I it's so not. Crazy. Yeah, and and. And I produced my first song with Sam Moore from Sam and Dave in 1990 for a movie. Wow. So I've been doing it a long time. It's not like I'm a newbie at this as a professional, but you know, I'm very honest. Like I'm very transparent. Like, you know, I'm not going to cover that up that they Ooh. really don't want to hire me. I feel it every time. And every time, except one production, they say to me, must be difficult as a female to blah 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 you know they're always saying that and sometimes i'm looking around the room oh they mean me like what okay. female because i just feel like part of the project and the producer sure but they they're but the powers that be you know they, they just now look at the charts and you'll see look at look at the at, at any any sinks in the movies and you'll see who produced mm. it it's it's almost always a male is there a uh movement or a conversation uh that is brewing to empower women or encourage them that uh this is one chair that they want to pursue i mean yes there are there are some yes and there's a nice organization called sound girls but they really focus more on engineering I see. on the female 
who's knob turning technical mm. rather than the producer, mm. right? Which is a different, totally creative sure. job. Sure, sure. Right. right, right. So, but yes, there there are some, you know, there's, there's also an interesting thing where the women don't seem to gravitate toward wanting to be producers. I was, I was going to ask that, you know, um, wow. You know, I mean, we can, we, let's walk down this street for just a second. Okay. Because, you know, you will hear uh, from the African-American community, uh, maybe a statement that says, well, you know, there's not many black marine biologists or, you know, just to throw out something hypothetically. And so the question always comes up, well, are they, and I'm speaking as a black man applying, is this an interest? Is this something that they want, you know? And, and you kind of, if you're, if you ask that question, if you're on the other side, especially if you're not black and you ask that question, it almost seems as if you're being disingenuous, but if, if there are not many black people who are looking to be marine biologists, of course, those numbers are going to be like that. So I was going to ask with respect to the women, are they, are they not, um, you know, interested in being music producers in that? Yeah, I, I do agree with being, you. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's for some, for some reason, there's a lack. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not really sure why maybe they think because it can't be done. Mm -hmm. Maybe they think because they wouldn't be good at it. But, but when you look at the also the study of the women female songwriters, only 12% of professional songwriters are women. So the study is taking into who makes money, right? What is making you a professional? The professional is because it doesn't mean you're better. Sure. Than, right? It just means you make a living doing it. You're commercially, you are making money. So the PROs, the labels, the study shows that only 12% of females are songwriters, mm -hmm. or of professional songwriters are female. Mm -hmm. Yet I know gazillions of females who write songs, right? And the population is pretty 50-50, male, female. So maybe those female songwriters just aren't getting as many opportunities, right? Okay. But so in terms they, of producers, mm -hmm. it really is very small I rarely meet a female who is aspiring or working as a producer. Very rarely. Yes. You opened up about five questions in me. I'm going to try to be go for it. brief, but uh, what do you, let's, let's go with the, the flip side. What do you like most about producing? Because uh, I think that's where my, my heart is. Uh, I'm, I'm a much better producer than I am a musician, but uh, what do you like about so you love it. That's awesome. That's awesome. I should ask you. Um, what I love about it is the creation, making the song come to life, making, working with musicians, because I don't believe in just working in the box. Yeah. I exactly. work with musicians, even if I'm making EDM, even if I'm making ur urban music, I have real musicians. Yeah. in the room. Yeah. I love working with musicians. They are amazingly special people. They are just, their minds are different. Yeah. Their everything is different and it's really wonderful. And I love working with singers, you know, great singers, vocalists who mm -hmm. I can sing them the scratch and they can make it Bless something it unbelievable. Right, exactly. And and it's so, so exciting. And like Niall, Niall used to say, everything I write sounds like a folk song. He calls it my folk magic, <laughs> but yet he gets it. It's yeah. an R&B song. Yeah. It's not a folk song. Right. So yeah. when I have the right musicians and the right singers mm -hmm. and my song comes to life, uh, there's, there's nothing better than mixing. And I love mixing. So sometimes I make my husband crazy because I'll, I'll, I'll just be like, you know, tweaking for days. Like it drives him crazy, like wanking. He calls it wanking. Cause then, you know, I want this a little louder and that a little softer and this a little this. And he's like, it's done. And I'm like, it's not done, but I love that. Right. right. The, 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 the whole process of all of it. Mm. I love it. Yes. Yeah. That's you? Really cool. You? You yeah. Know? With the production. Yeah. I, lo I love the journey. I love the blank canvas. Uh, and you you paint this idea on it. And as you say, working with vocalists or musicians, 
and the technology and just getting involved with, there was nothing here when we sat down a couple of weeks ago and now we are taking people on the journey. So all of it, the layers, I just, I yeah. Like and when, and with the, the technology band. too, because yeah. if you're making dance music mm-hmm. and you have no effects and then you dial in some cool effects and you go, let's try this, let's That's do right. that. Oh my God, that is like so exciting. It's just, you know, and then if I, if you are playing bass and I'm, you're going boom, do boom, or me, I'm saying, I want boom, do boom, do boom. Right. And you're going, well, what about if I go boom, do boom, boom, right? And then I'm Sorry. going, yeah, that's better, right? We're working together. It's not like all about like, what does the arranger say? It's yes. like, what does the musician want to do? What is that's he? Right. What is, or what, what is the song telling you? I mean, because sometimes the song? Yeah. the song is teaching you what it needs. I mean, and and sometimes I've gone with a preconceived idea, like, okay, well, this is going to be the instrumentation, and you get a couple of minutes down the road, and the song says, you know, that's not what I need, and just yeah, you're absolutely right. The song tells you, and I tell my students that too. When you're writing and when you're producing, yeah. the song tells you exactly. Thank you for saying that because the song tells you what it wants. Exactly. It, it's, it's just, if you allow it, right. I think mm-hmm. that's part of having experience as well as, is learning to allow it to tell you that, yeah, right. Yeah. Rather than, right. than you having to control every second of it so that it becomes something. And then I have to tweak stuff. Yeah. And I will tell you as a female and, and it's happens to me on so many occasions, like I'll have to do like 25 remixes. Mm. They would never do that to you. Mm. I mean, I never... had ABC and Disney and Lionsgate and all different attorneys at different companies saying, can you send me all those mixes? I want to hear what you had to do because they cannot believe that I was tortured like that. And the reason is they don't trust me because they don't trust themselves. That's right. right. They, don't, they don't trust me. So especially let's say I'm working on a hip hop song. Because I, I obviously look at all the artists you've mentioned. So you yeah. can see that I've worked a ton with Definitely. black music. Yes. Right. Okay. I'm a five foot tiny white girl again. You know? Okay. They don't trust me. And I'm sitting there going, I know what I, what I know. And this is good. No, they're going to torture me. If mm-hmm. you were producing it they would trust you, they would hear you, they would see you. So we have to stop all this stuff because this stuff is is worse in reverse as well, that that it's just crazy stuff and music needs to transcend that, right? Because, because, uh, you know, so I get a lot of that. So, okay, okay. Here you go. So, so what does Harry say about that? I mean, you know, they, they, they these people would know who your husband is and that, you know, not that he has to vouch for you as as you're covering, but he's a, he is the expert and his wife. Yeah, is but I'm supposed to be the expert. They don't really use to, which I appreciate because that would probably upset me if they were doing that because I'm the expert. They're hiring me. Mm-hmm. Right. True, but true. I have had a couple of occasions where some people have insulted something in the mix. Hmm. Or he's the engineer. And I have had to list his credits and go, hello, hello. You know, uh, but he laughs because if it's about him, he, he's so he's secure. He doesn't care. He laughs. He thinks it's funny. You know, he knows he did a good job and he knows sure. he knows what he's doing. So, exactly. so, Right. And for me, he's always surprised, like, okay, so if I have a musician in the studio, right? Yeah. And I'm engineering while they're recording, but if something serious needs to be done, I'm not a great engineer. I'm a basic engineer. I can record vocals. I can record guitars and live instruments. And yeah, I can, I know how to do that. But I mean, if there's something really special, I'm going to call him in and ask him to help. Certainly. The next day, you'll see posts on Facebook saying, thank you for producing me, Harry. Okay, but he didn't produce them. I produced them. And, and, and I had my engineer come, right, and help yeah. do some technical stuff. No, 
So he, Harry will then, like you're saying, for sure, he always posts back. I'm not the producer. Michelle's the producer. You know, he will always do that, which wow. is really beautiful. Yeah. But he never understood until he had to start doing that. Because I would tell him, they, they think you're the producer if you come in the room. And he would go, no. But then finally he saw, yes, if he comes in the room, in the control room, they think he's the producer. That's really interesting. <laughs> I'm, 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 you can knock me over with a feather right now because I, I, I thought we were so far past this. I mean, it, it, I thought we were so far past this. It's, it's a little disconcerting. Yeah, right. But so what do I say about that? Okay, that's life. It's just life. You take and a so swim, right? I don't, yeah, I don't let it, right. I don't let it get in my way. I just go about doing what I'm doing. I keep striving. That's, that's what we need to do, right? Because mm -hmm. if we always are thinking, oh, it's so hard, I'm a girl. Oh, it's so hard, I'm black. Oh, it's right. so hard, I'm this, an Asian. And oh, it's so, we're not gonna go get it. Go nowhere, that's right. Yeah, right. So, so, so I just say, okay, but I'm doing it. So it's a little harder, it's a little harder, and I have to work a little harder for it. Like if you were producing, you could, like Niall, when Niall produces often, he would leave a checklist for the musicians and he would leave. Mm -hmm. And he would tell them, I want you to change this, I want you to fix this, and he'd give them a whole bunch of things and he'd leave for an hour and he'd come back and, and see what they did. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I have to be in the room for every kick drum because if not, they think the drummer's the producer. Mm. So, but as a male, you don't have to do that. As a male, you can leave, you can come back, you're the producer, everybody gets that, you just gave them some notes, it's okay. So for me, I just have to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, I cannot disappear. Wow. So, but that's okay, so I'm there, right? So we all work around. Can, can, why don't you, would you, would you uh, do us this favor and, and let us know a couple songs that uh, have done very, very well and you're the producer so we can just celebrate that moment that you rose above the ranks, killed well, the past I almost, So just, um, yeah, almost all my music placements mm -hmm. I produced. Mm -hmm. So uh, the title for Vivica Fox's show, 1-800-Missing, mm -hmm. I produced that. And Kina on Atlantic Records sings that. She was an urban artist. Mm -hmm. uh, my first placement, which was with Sam Moore from Sam Moore, Sam, you know, Sam and Dave, I produced right. that. That's in the TV show Car 54, Where Are You? Actually, that's mm -hmm. my second, my second placement. Um, I would have to go look down my credit sheet because I pretty much produced everything that I've done. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, Irene Cara, I produced two hit dance singles for her. Yeah. Uh, oh my God, I, I have to, I'd have to take out my credit sheet and ask me, I'd have to look. I, I never remember what I've done, yeah. but, but pretty much everything. I've pretty yeah. much produced everything except a handful of things. Like when I work with Jonathan Butler, he mm -hmm. produces it, um, but pretty much everything. Yeah. That, you, that you see every placement, every artist. Um, I, I had a bunch of hit songs with some big J-pop artists. One BTS, I'm not BTS, sorry. Um, they're called um, TVXQ mm -hmm. and they're huge, sell millions and millions of records. And I produced that in Japan on AVEX and oh. bunches of other big artists on, in Japan on Universal that I've produced with that J-pop stuff. And oh my God, just thousands of things. My goodness. And, it, and I wasn't exaggerating at the beginning when I said uh, 365, 24 seven, not a day goes by where a Michelle Vice Maslin's composition, collaboration or production is not playing somewhere in the world. And that's just the truth. That's not exaggeration or lie or high form. Yeah, that's crazy stuff, but that's actually true. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. true. Yeah. So what did I tell you? The real deal. And as I said before, next week, 
we will pick up this conversation. I may back it up a little bit just for uh, continuing context, but you know, I had to find a, a place to splice it. So, you know, uh, it's a cliffhanger of sorts, but we were so grateful for the time that she shared with us. And uh, I know that you loved it. I know that you felt her spirit. I hope you were taking notes. And she is very accessible at sweetersongs.com. Very accessible for a woman of uh, her iconic status. And uh, just a great, great person. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you will share this uh, content, uh, put it on your own social media page. I hope if you're not a subscriber that you will come and register with us. There's four tiers of registering uh, to become a subscriber at The Entree Musician. The first one is fan or follower or friend or family member. So we, we try to make it as economically feasible as possible because everybody needs a cup of coffee at some point. So we're not trying to kill anybody on monthly uh, subscriptions, but we do all that we can to provide the best access, uh, collaborative uh, opportunities and other forms of engagement so that you know that you're in with us because you're an entree musician. That's just the way it is. You are an entree musician and we're all out here trying to win together. So tune in next week again to hear part two of our conversation with Michelle Vice Maslin. And in between times, tell everybody you know and 10 people you don't know that you hang out here at The Entree Musician. My name is Jerry B. Of course, I am The Entree Musician, but so are you. And we will see you next time. God bless.